Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Renee Watson, and I'm the author of Love is a Revolution. And I'm so honored to spend the evening with these amazing authors to celebrate young adult Black voices and activism. Uh, I'm going to ask the author's question. We'll be talking for a little bit, and then we'll definitely open it up for questions. So please, if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat. You can send your questions to us as we are talking, and feel free to if, if something resonates with you, you can say amen and shout us out and you know uh, vibe with us tonight. We hope that this feels communal even though we're not in the same space. So uh, please engage with us. And um, again, just I'm excited to be here with these authors. Instead of reading their bios, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and give you a short summary of their book and uh, then we'll get started. We're gonna start with Namina and then we'll just uh, go around and end with Fred. Hi guys, my name is Namna Forna. I am the author, uh, new New York Times bestselling author of The Gilded Ones, woohoo! Um, I am from Sierra Leone, West Africa, born and raised, uh, and I now live in LA where uh, I also work as a screenwriter. My book is called The Gilded Ones. It is set in an African inspired world where there are a group of girls who are considered demons because they're faster and stronger than regular people and they bleed gold. Uh, one day actual demons invade this world and the humans realize, hey, we sort of need these girls to fight these demons and we offer them a choice, fight or die. My main character, Deka, chooses to fight and therefore goes in, on a journey that ends up changing her life. I guess we'll go next. Hi there, I'm Maika Mulit. I'm Maritza Mulit. Hi. Yeah, go ahead, you want to do it. <laughs> You want to okay. <laughs> so we're sisters. If you couldn't tell. And nemesis. And also co-authors of Dear Haiti Love Elaine and one of the good ones. Um, so one of the good ones is about 17, just turned 18-year-old Kezi Smith, who dies under very mysterious circumstances in police custody after attending the social justice rally. Um, and to commemorate their history buff sister's life. Happy and Jenny Smith decide to embark on a journey using Kezi's heirloom copy of the Negro Motorist Green Book. And we're biased, but we think that one of the good ones will leave you shook and wondering what it really means to be an ally. Yes, it's a tale about the family members who are left behind in the midst of a very public tragedy. And we hope that people who read it will be able to consider what it really means to be an ally. Great, I guess it's my turn to jump in here. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Fred Joseph and I am the New York Times bestselling author of The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person. Uh, the Black Friend on Being a Better White Person uh, is a mixture of things. I, I like to think that it's uh, three pronged. Um, one, it's, it's a YA book that allows young people to better understand um, daily manifestations of racism, right? So instead of just talking about the historical context of racism, you know, Jim Crow, uh, slavery, things of that nature, it talks about things that happen every single day, like why you shouldn't touch a black woman's hair and uh, you know, why you shouldn't assume that the black kid in your class plays basketball, things of that nature. Um, and then I use my, my the, double, the second prong, I use my personal experiences from elementary school, high school, college, et cetera, um, to basically give real, ex to give real examples of all the instances in which I'm talking about. And my goal with that was to help non-white people feel seen, frankly. Um, when I thought about writing this book, I said, well, what would I have needed growing up, right? To feel as though somebody dealt with or is dealing with the same things that I'm dealing with um, you know, being in predominantly white spaces when I leave my home, uh, generally. So I wrote that. And then the third prong is honestly um, just a tool guide for everyone um, to better understand not just uh, race, ra manifestations of racism, um, but, you know, the importance of anti-racism and honestly general bigotry and why it's important to combat it. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be in conversation with all of you. I think our works uh, speak to each other in very different ways. Um, and so I'm excited about this conversation. I wanted to kind of ground the evening thinking about Toni Morrison and her work, it's her birthday. She would have been 90 today, I believe. Uh, so I wanted to read this quote to get our conversation started. Um, she is a friend of my mind. She gather me, man. 
the pieces I am, she gather them and give them back to me in all the right order. It's good, you know, when you have a woman who is a friend of your mind. I wanted to start here because, um, so Fred, in your dedication, you talk about your mother and grandmother um, and one of the good ones, we have this sister relationship and um, there's a dynamic with women in that book. Um, and Namina, you have mentioned, I've seen interviews with you talking about the women in your life, the women in your family who gave you the tools to persevere. So I wanted to throw out the question, um, how have black women inspired you and inspired your work? If we can talk about that a little bit and anyone can begin. So I, I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> Thank I'll you. I'll jump in because I, I want to heap praise on um, not only Namina and Mike and Maritza, I, I want to heap praise on you, Renee, um, because it, like I said beforehand, and I want to say it for everyone, you know, I'm on a panel right now with brilliant black women and authors at that. Um, and, and that's that's such an amazing thing um, to have. You know, I've, I've gone through each of your works um, and I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, in terms of, you know, black women and the influence of my life, uh, you know, I'm very honest in my in my book about my own experiences, and I wouldn't be here had it not been for my mother and my grandmother, right? Like Black women are at the epicenter of every single thing that I do, um, and I think that there's a through line of um, empathy, thoughtfulness, and understanding that that started in, in the home and leads its way right into my book, right? Like trying to embrace the things that they taught me and and the courage that Black women walk through the world with, and I try to 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 really have that resonate with readers um, as they're going along in, in my story. Um, I'll go next. Uh, I think for me, Black women, like I also would not be here without Black women. First of all, um, the first people I want to talk about are my mom and my sister, because like my mom and my sister, both um, immigrants like me, came to, my mom came to America um, after she'd already had a full career as a lawyer back in Sierra Leone, had to go back to law school here again while working as a waitress, while raising kids. And when she tried to become a lawyer, uh, she would not get, she could not get hired because she was at this point a, um, a black immigrant in like her 30s and 40s. And people were like, oh no. So she created her own law firm and she persevered again. And through just watching her, that was the way that I learned how to become a writer or rather how to persevere on my journey. Because like when I saw her like keep getting slapped down and keep going back up, I realized if she can do it, I can do it. It's the same thing with my sister. And it's also the, the other thing is I went to Spelman College, which is all black and all female. And there like I found a community of strong and beautiful black women who truly held me. And actually my book, The Gilded Ones is sort of an homage to Spelman, even though it's like a twisted and brutal homage, but it is still because Spelman was a space filled with black women who basically pushed each other to do better, who said, all right, girl, like if you're feeling down right now, that is fine. We're here for you, but we're also here to lift you up. And that's sort of what I wanted to uh, reflect in my book where the sisterhoods are sort of all encompassing and the love story in my book, the primary love story is actually the sisterhood between the women rather than uh, the romance that's actually there. Yeah, so Maritza and I, we're the two oldest of four women. So four sisters, um, we have our mom with us, our grandma with us and their influence in our lives, it has been like there's no way to really measure it, right? Like we always tell our grandma how lucky we are that she decided one day that she was gonna come to the States and give us the opportunity to have a better life. And so, you know, when my grandma talks about some of the things that she's gone through and she looks at us, she, she looks at us with pride. And that's something that I see reflected in the dynamics of interacting with other black women, just how, you know, readily we are there to like big up one another like look at you yes you're doing it you're killing it and I just like that encouragement is um wonderful I would say even in our publishing career this one of the good ones is just our second book but you know pre-corona when we were able to go to any um book events we were able to 
see other really amazing black women. And I remember one time Renee Watson came up to us and she was just like, yeah, here, here's my number. And we were like, ah, she's giving us her number. <laughs> so yeah, so black women across, you know, run the gamut of the impact and influence over our very lives, but also just being in this, you know, publishing industry, trying to figure out what you're doing, how encouraging and welcoming it is to interact with um, the black women in this industry, so. Do you want to add anything? Um, I would just say that we also talk about like the idea of sisterhood and womanhood in one of the good ones, particularly because um, our characters uh, come from a very religious background, like us, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and um, something that you see growing up in the church a lot is that the men get all of the praise in the Bible. It's this man who begat this son, who begat another son, who begat another son. And we were always questioning like, well, where are the mothers and the sisters and everyone else? So uh, we actually decided to name our characters after some uh, women who do get named in the Bible, um, just as, uh, as, as recognition and acknowledgement of that. I love that. And I love the idea of the women who've inspired us. I mean, I, I could say amen to everything you all said. I would not be here without the women in my family, the neighborhood that I grew up in. I always felt so sheltered and loved and nurtured by those women. And I think of, and the women writers, like women I don't even know, right? Who kind of mentored me just by me reading their work and them leaving their legacy. And I think about their impact on me. And then hopefully what I'm doing for others and thinking about writing for young people, I wonder, uh, in a way, I feel like each book you have is, is a legacy you leave. And so when we're thinking about, you know, we started talking about Tony and we're talking about these women in our lives um, and the impact that they've left on us. What do you all hope your work is doing for young people or will do in the world? What impact um, do you want to leave through your work? I think about, I'll say this, the last, when, when a reader reads the last sentence of the book, that you have put out in the world, this most, most recent book, um, what do you want them to be feeling and thinking about? I, I guess well, I'll, oh, please, no, please right, go right ahead. I knew we were gonna overlap on each other because of the Zoom environment, <laughs> sorry y'all. <laughs> but um, I would say for readers who are reading our book, um, specifically talking to young black readers to see that you don't have to get caught up in the respectability bubble, right? Because we know that respectability doesn't save us. What's more, and I've mentioned this before, but you know, what's more respectable than playing a game in a park by yourself? What's more respectable than sleeping at home in your bed? What's more respectable than sitting on your couch and eating ice cream, right? And we know that even in these moments of respectability, your black skin makes you a target, makes you seem as if you know you are less than, less than human. But I want that, you know, especially for young Black readers, if they go through the pages of one of the good ones and when they come to the end of it, that they feel, you know, the, the people who usually have their voices taken away from them, that you still have power. And that, you know, it's kind of our responsibility with the voices that we do have to raise other people who are marginalized. For me, I hope that when someone finishes one of the good ones, they will stop and kind of take stock of where they are um, because allyship is a process. It is something that you continuously have to work toward. So whether you are a white person who has more racial ethnic privilege than a person of color, but if you are someone who is heterosexual, cisgender, who has more uh, privilege in this society because of that part of your identity, constantly interrogate within yourself if you are doing the best that you can to make sure that other people feel seen and understood and welcomed and celebrated in the spaces that you're a part of. And if that isn't the case, that you're using the privilege that you do have in whatever capacity that is to make sure that we get closer to that ideal. Um, I think for me with the Gilded Ones, I wanted a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that the Gilded Ones examines patriarchy, it examines what um, it looks like, who suffers under it, like how is it uh, constructed, how is it sort of furthered. And I wanted like when people finish the book to feel angry, you know, to feel like this is really messed up, 
to see the parallels between um, that, um, the world of Otera and this world and to realize sort of the constructs and the systems that they live in. The other thing that I wanted, uh, especially for uh, young people, especially for people who are, uh, especially for young black and brown um, girls, people who are gender diverse and all of these things is I wanted, I wanted them to sort of claim their defini definitions of themselves for themselves. And what I mean by this is I think often when you are sort of not a cisgendered heterosexual white dude, like everybody has a box that they put you in. And especially uh, if you're like a, if you are like a black woman, if you're like anything that's quote unquote an other, people will always find definitions for you. And I really wanted for um, my primary audience, like young people to be able to make, define who they are absent of what everybody else is saying outside because I think that's really important like I think that if we don't do if we don't define who we are other people do that for you and it's often to your detriment um so that was what I really wanted people to get from the gilded ones yeah I, I think for me um because there's there's multiple audiences for my book I think in terms of the most straightforward audience white people and young white people specifically I wanted people to think about whiteness and not just white supremacy, right? Like white rage and the entitlement of whiteness and, and the existence of toxic whiteness and understanding that that seeps into every single aspect of our lives, not ours being non-white people, but ours being a society. Um, and, and then for non-white people, uh, especially young people, I wanted them to feel not alone, right? Like I said before, um, when when I wrote the book, I wanted to fill a gap. I, I didn't want to just write another anti-racist book, um, you know, to jump on a fad or a trend or anything like that. I wanted to write something that at 15, 16, 17, I needed to read. And, and, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really for um, young people uh, such as um, this young woman I think of right now who I actually wanted to mention before in terms of black people who inspire me or black women who inspire me specifically, uh, Taylor Richardson in Jacksonville, Florida, um, Astro Sarbright, uh, who has read the book and raised money to donate a thousand copies of the book around the country so that people can feel seen and heard and so white people can get it right because she's at a predominantly white school in Florida and when she read the book she's like this is my experience. I want more people to understand. Thank you for speaking to that experience. So I, I think that those are the experiences that I want. I just wanted to shout out Taylor, honestly. Thank you for everything you've done for the book, Taylor. That is so awesome. I love when readers um, engage with us and start spreading the word and, and um, showing their love by making sure the book gets into as many hands as possible. Um, I wanna just remind those of you who are tuning in and watching, please, if you have questions, comments, you can go ahead and start sending them in. In a little bit, we'll be opening it up um, and taking your questions soon. Um, I wanted to talk also about thinking about, okay, so we're writing you know, for our audiences. We're writing about race and gender and the intersections of race, class, and gender and all of that. And then we're living our black lives, right? So we're not just writing about it, we live this. Um, what is it like for you? I've heard, um, I know with one of the good ones, you all, I've seen interviews where you spoke about you wrote this book pre-summer of 2020, and there were people alive when you were writing it who are no longer with us, right? Um, I know the emotional toll it takes on me to sometimes go there on the page and be vulnerable and write about all these things. So I'm curious how you all um, are taking care of yourselves as you're writing these stories. And if you can talk a little bit about what that, what that part of writing, we talk a lot about the craft and plot and how do you create a story and, and the research that goes into what we're doing. But then there's also you as an author and, and, and how are you taking care of yourself as a black author? So E.B. Zaboy, who is one of our favorite authors ever. Love E.B. <laughs> <Yay! laughs> um, she mentioned this uh, way of framing her books, which Aika and I just like latched onto when we saw it and have never let go of. So she talks about like writing inhale books and exhale books. So an exhale book is like, now let's start with inhaling. <laughs> an inhale book <laughs> is like taking 
a really big breath and kind of like holding it in your chest and it takes a lot out of you. And then an exhale book is like an easy, slow release and it's just out into the universe and it feels good and nice. Mm -hmm. So our first book, Dear Haiti Love Elaine, was an exhale book. It was what we wanted to read when we were younger. It was fun. It was like an example of a type of story that you don't get often when you are writing about Black characters. Like oftentimes it's very heavy and sad and terrible. And those stories deserve to get told, but there are other stories out there as well. And then uh, one of the good ones was definitely an inhale book. And I have felt like we have been holding on to this breath since we wrote it and going through this period now of talking about it and um, just the significance of the, of, of writing the story that is so relevant to some to a period that is happening now is a a reminder that what we were writing about has been an issue for much longer than the summer of 2020. You know, this has been uh, in, in conversations at kitchen tables in books that people have been writing about in speeches that we've been listening to for centuries. So even though more people who perhaps weren't paying attention before are paying attention now, doesn't take away from the fact, the fact that this has been going on for so long and we're just one additional voice to this very wide and deep chorus. Um, so it's been hard and I have, I mean, we're in graduate school and, and that distracts us, schoolwork, but also watching WandaVision. I know that's a, <laughs> a little sw <laughs> a switch, but it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, talking about one of the good ones has been, intense to put it nicely. Um, writing this story took a lot out of us. Like it was very heavy. Um, the reason why we started to write it is because we're from Miami, Florida. And a few years ago, our great aunt passed away. And when we were walking through the cemetery, we were looking at the names of people who passed away. And one of those names was Trayvon Martin's name. And that stuck with us because his Miami was our Miami. Like, you know, people talk about Miami being this, this place with salsa music and tiki tiki dancing on the beach, but it's a totally different existence if you are black. And so we kept that with us and we knew that we wanted to write this story that tackles racial injustice in America, but we knew that we couldn't have that conversation without looking at the past. But in terms of self-care, one, therapy, um, if, if you can do it, um, this process has been really hard going through the interview process. Just, you know, we're constantly talking about this book. And what's really interesting is that, you know, um, we found that when we have interviews with white interviewers, they like to focus on the trauma points like, oh, yes. tell us about the hanging bridge. Tell us about um, sundown towns. Right. But when we speak with black folks and other people of color, they talk about they'll mention it, but we're able to delve into so much more because black people, we aren't just our pain. So um, this has been a really intense process. Um, I think Nick Stone had a video that she posted on her Instagram story a few mm -hmm. days ago. And that totally resonated with me because, you know, if I look at how one of the good ones has been received in comparison to Dear Haiti Love Elaine, it feels like, oh, the pain book is what people are latching onto. And it's not that we don't need these stories to be told because it's evident that we do, but I want people to imagine black folks in so many other roles, not mm -hmm. just the, the pain that we experience because I don't know about you, but being black is fabulous and I love it. So right. let's highlight like that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh my God. I feel like you guys just said a lot of the things that I sort of felt and experienced. So the Gilded Ones, um, is really a book about trauma. Uh, I grew up during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. I grew up at the beginning of it. And uh, one of the things that I'm very frank with is that I have PTSD. And at the beginning of doing this process, and for me, like what has been happening with like uh, the quarantine and all these things are like really tri huge triggers for me because like when I was growing up, there was a coup and there's all these things. So anytime there's any type of political unrest, it's very difficult for me to function. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found was that in interviews, like this is a fantasy book, you know, it's it's girls bleeding gold, fighting the patriarchy and all the things. But um, like you guys said, in interviews, when I was speaking with white people, they'd always ask me about that. And then um, if I was speaking with other people, um, black and brown people, there was room for more. And one of the things that's really helped um, is therapy. Um, I actually think that 
this year for all, and by this year, I'm just going to call this like the pandemic industrial complex, which is 2020, 2021, is all the same year to me. Mm -hmm. um, I actually feel that on some level, it's been very helpful because I was able to, in real time, tra target my triggers and like work through them. Um, so what I found is that I think I'm actually much, much better because like now I can say with clarity that, hey, this is what this is and this is what that is. And I think it's been that whole circle of having to do these interviews and talk about this stuff while being here in this time, I've really sort of had to figure out a way to carve that space um, and figure out a way to like really tell people that, hey, this is what's happening with me right now. Because before I used to be sort of like ashamed of it. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. with my experience, I, I always sort of struggled with like, I didn't want to be known as tragedy girl because I feel like it's, um, I feel like it's so, um, it's so sort of, I hate to say this, but it almost feels sort of, sort of typical, like the African comes from a war, you know, and all these mm. things. But this year has sort of really helped me, this pandemic industrial complex has really helped me process it and move forward in a way because I finally had the space to talk about it and figure out, figure it out, but also to sort of put boundaries on, hey, mm -hmm. this is what this is. This is where I'm at and you can't cross this line because like it is what it is. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, you know, everyone mentioned therapy. So I'll mention therapy again. And, I, mm -hmm. and I'll mention therapy specifically as a black man because I think that there's such a um, specific conditioning um, and anti-therapy um, for so many. So um, I'll just put that out there. You know, the, the Black friend, you know, I, I wrote the Black friend prior to the 2020 summer as well. And I find myself when the book debuted um, two months ago, and even now at the intersection of everything, because who knew that this year would be this year, or like, or mm -hmm. uh, Namina said, the, the 2020-2021 pandemic industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. Who knew that these years would be as they are? So everything that people are, are giving me, everything I'm receiving is race, racism, white supremacy, so on and so forth. And that is heavy. I did, I wrote a book that was about my experiences and, and writing the book was cathartic, right? Writing the book, finally being open and honest about some of the things I had been through, not, not things that are so um, entrenched in white supremacy that we talk about them on a daily basis, such as, you know, police brutality, but things that are nuanced, right? Like, hey, I really liked, um, you know, Kobe Calais or Taylor Swift's first song and that's okay and I'm black, you know, <laughs> or like I'm loving WandaVision and yes, I took kids to see Black Panther, but I'm also just a geek, right? And that's also really important, um, you know, for example, but this year because of the book has been rough because everyone has now dwindled me and simplified me to the one concept and even and that inherently is coming from a white gaze right like I exist within a white gaze though if you had read the book you would try to do the complete opposite right, right? you know yeah. people are people are getting the book and they're like you're the white gaze. you I'm like no you haven't read the book so um you know so for me I, 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 a lot of therapy has been helpful <laughs> word oh, I, yes to therapy I yeah, actually want to add I actually want to add another thing that's been really helpful is so I'm an anime geek, like, like super. Um, so when things get rough, I'm watching Attack on Titan. I'm watching Parasite, you know, like I'm watching um, the slime, you know, like these are the things that I'm watching. Like I really like like hyper violent things. Ooh, Overlord, my favorite. Like it just, it really makes me happy. This is my happy place. I just like to, you know, see pe people's heads get chopped off and it's, it's, it's a really entertaining thing for me. It is what it is. I just want to say shout out to Black Geekdom. It, di it didn't go over my head that everybody's watching anime, WandaVision, every so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I preach about Black dynamism and this is it, you know, absolutely. So thanks for saying that. <laughs> and thank you all for talking about therapy. I think it's important it's, uh, for Black people and also for young people to know that uh, that is an option and that we need to be talking to each other or to someone and processing all this 
this daily trauma that is happening, let alone what, whatever else is happening, right, in our, our personal lives. Um, so we're going to go to questions. And as we prepare for that, I want to talk about these covers real quick, because I mean, come on. Oh, I love, I love, I love all of our covers. <laughs> and I'm just so excited about the shift that I see more and more and more um, with just beautiful Black girls and boys and people on covers and all their beauty and brilliance and these bright colors. And so I just, I'm curious if any of you want to talk about your cover or the shout out the artist or talk about the process for um, how it was to come about that your cover is so amazing. Well, and then we're, we'll go to questions after that. Uh, I'll definitely go first. I love my cover. So uh, the artist who did my cover, his name is Johnny Tarajosu. He is amazing. Um, honestly, this wasn't the first cover that we had. Um, and when I thought of the cover, you know, I, I like was like the gilded ones, you know, uh, the, the tone is like 300. It's hyper. It's like, I know, right? Like, look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh, all of our covers sort of match. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Um, but like when I was thinking about the book, I was like, ooh, the gilded ones, it's sort of ominous, you know, like the tonally in my book, like when I was writing this book, like, um, cause I wrote it way long to like, I, the, I wrote the first draft around 2012, like my touchstones for tone were like 300 and Spartacus blood and sand. So, I, and if y'all know these works, yes. these are hyper violent works, because again, it is what it is. This is what I enjoy. Um, and so I thought like the cover was going to be something really ominous and dark and maybe like gold blood dripping or whatever. But then my editor was like, I know this artist, he is amazing. Um, let, let him take a whack at it. And I was like, mm -hmm, sure. And so when I saw this, uh, this cover, it honestly, it was not what I expected, but it was the perfect cover for it because it when I perfect. looked at it in all the sort of imaginings that I'd had, I'd forgotten the fact that the girls in the Gilded Ones are 16 year olds, 15, 16. These are sort of really innocent children that all this stuff is happening to, you know, which sort of mimics like my background with all the stuff that happened in Sierra Leone. And so I love this cover because it really speaks to that innocence. And it's something that I had not thought of or imagined, but was actually perfection for the book. And I'm so, mm -hmm grateful to uh, my, I'm so grateful to the artist. He's just phenomenal. Anybody else want to chime in? Yes. Oh, <laughs> um, I <clears throat> loved hearing that story, Namina, because I mean, when I first saw the cover, I like gasped, like, ah, like beautiful. That we sent each other covers back and forth and Gilded Ones was Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Um, so for one of the good ones, um, our Publisher is awesome. They like asked us, oh, what are you thinking for the cover? And we knew that we wanted to have our three sisters, not our sisters, but uh, our three characters on the cover. We have Jenny with her twist and Kezi with her TWA and Happy with her perm, a relaxer. <laughs> and um, it was so amazing to be able to see Oh, the the characters and like the different hair textures and the different colors of the skin and the fact that like we wanted to include green because of the important significance of the green book in our story and it's like part of the what is it called the cup the jacket what like the the, the, the stuff inside the but design. yeah um but the art director is Gigi Lau and she's awesome and the artist was Rochelle Baker and she does phenomenal work so we're we're ridiculously happy about our cover yes i could stare at all of these covers all day <laughs> all day <laughs> fred what about you so i want to first shout out um your cover renee because your <laughs> cover your cover is is gorgeous thank and, you and funny six degrees of separation the artist who did your cover actually um did a commission piece for my fiance and i oh. um for our birthday um, her, our friends are friends with her, uh, her and she did a piece for us. So Alex um, Cabal, her name. Yeah, yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in terms of my cover, um, super excited because I wanted everything around the book to be black women powered. So my, mm -hmm. my, my cover, um, done by Zaria Shin, 
Uh, I'll say it again for everybody. Zaria Shin, go to ZariaShin.com. That's Z-H-A-R-I-A. Uh, Shin is S-H-I-N-N. Uh, the, the UK cover is done by Nadina Ali. Um, the teacher's guide is done by Sonia Cherry Paul. So everything is just like, you know, when you asked about black women earlier, you know, I just, everything, I'm just surrounded by black greatness. So that's, that's my cover. She did a phenomenal job. That is so awesome. Yeah. I'm loving, I feel like it is almost its own kind of uh, renaissance that we're having in children's lit right now with seeing so many books uh, by and about black people and also having this front and center on the cover, the way that we describe the characters, because, you know, sometimes that doesn't always match, but more and more, I feel like that is happening. I'm so happy to see it. Okay, we have some questions from the audience. Um, how would you suggest educators connect and go about encouraging activism among their students? And I would add to that, how do you hope educators are using your work in the classroom? Well, we have uh, an educator's guide for one of the good ones. And um, we also have like a reader's discussion guide. So it has like a Spotify playlist that we put together, other books that could be in conversation with this um, story, um, just dialogue around the different topics that we discuss in one of the good ones. Because one of our main characters, um, Kezi, she's a lesbian, right? And she's growing up in this very religious household. So when the characters are going through and you hear the refrain, one of the good ones throughout, you see how it sounds when it's coming from a white person, when it sounds when it's coming from a black person talking about their sister or another black person talking about a black person that they see in the distance, right? So um, we want educators to have these conversations about the ways that, you know, the different intersections of your identity might come under, you know, pressure or under the magnifying lens, depending on who you're surrounded by. But um, we do have an educator's guide. Um, I can't remember the name of the doctor who made it. I can't remember her name right now, but if I remember it, I'll drop it in the chat and then I will also give a shout out later and include the link, but yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, so um, I mentioned before, I guess I, I jumped the gun. So Sonia Sherry Paul did my educator's guide. Uh, she's also currently writing um, Stamped for Kids. So she, she's just a brilliant individual um, all around. And, you know, I guess for me, um, you know, the book speaks for itself. I, I think any educator who reads it and, and can't navigate educating kids based on it, you know, should probably reevaluate a few things, I suppose. <laughs> I, I think it's funny that you said that. I'm always um, challenging educators to, if I think the more that we, as, and I, I've taught for many years, um, and I've learned over the years that the more I am doing this work in my real life, the easier it is for me to do it in the classroom, right? So I don't have to necessarily research for um, a lesson plan because I'm already in, taking in all this work. I'm having these conversations as an adult, and I'm thinking about, how to bring this in the classroom. So I, I'll throw out some resources for educators. I think Rethinking Schools, Teaching Tolerance, um, the Howard Zinn Project is all amazing resources. If you're thinking about social justice, activism, and getting young people thinking about what's happening in their world. And uh, those, a lot of them have lesson plans that are by teachers. So it's not someone thinking about what you should be doing in the classroom. It's actual teachers who are doing this work. So shout out to them and to all the educators who are bringing these books in classrooms and, and sometimes in schools where it, there might be some pushback from administration. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that educators are having these conversations with young people. Uh, Namina, do you want to add anything before we go to the next question? Um, yes, certainly. Uh, with the Gilded Ones, the way that I approached the book was, again, I wanted to break down what a patriarchal society looks like. You know, what are the things that, are, that supported um, society, religion, all of these things. So I feel that like any educator who looks at um, this book will see that it's sort of like a really simple way to show what are the tenets of living in a hyper patriarchal society. And for me, I did a lot of research um, about feminism, like, um, I did a lot of research on feminist literature and all of these things that sort of went into how I crafted this book. And I think that that's, a, and I think that just having a discussion about this book in class is a really sort of simple way to talk about what, what do, what does a patriarchy look like? What are like some of the nice ways that it looks like? Because 
you know, a lot of times it can look very flowery and seem like it's for your own go good and what are like the harsher ways that it can look like. So I think it's sort of all there. We have a question about um, the books that you're reading or, or books that you love that maybe are not necessarily new, but just your go-to Black authored books that you want to recommend, especially thinking of young adult. It's always the hardest question, right? <laughs> oh, I can go first. Um, okay. So um, some of my favorite books are The Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed. Um, that is an absolutely phenomenal book, very beautifully written. Um, another one is uh, This Is My America by Kim Johnson. Like phenomenal book, like structurally perfect, great character. I just, I really love that book. Another one is Ray Bearer, which is again, beautifully written, sings to my heart, uh, A Song of Wraiths and Ruin um, by Rose, um, oh my God, like, it's so hard for me to say her name because I know her as Rosie, but it's Roseanne um, Brown. Uh, so these are some of the books that I always tend to go back to because like, I love these books. Um, I think they're so well written and so well done, and I would highly recommend them for anybody. I love romantic comedies, so I am a huge fan of Christina Flores. Uh, she wrote Now That I Found You most recently, and it's about a girl who's trying to find her ridiculously famous actress grandmother in New York City and happens to fall in love in the process, so right up my alley. Um, I love Ben Philippe's The Field Guide to the North American Teenager because Ben is hilarious online and he just translates that into his book and it's so quirky and fun. Um, and I also really enjoyed Pride by Evie Savoy because I love me some Pride and Prejudice, particularly the 2005 version of the movie. And um, <laughs> just the fact that it's a book that takes something that is so classic and long-standing and uh, puts a twist on it that makes it more fun and relatable to me um, is awesome. So those, I'll stop there. Yes. Okay. So if I, two books that I say, like if you merge them together, you get me The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo and Odd One Out by Nick Stone. <laughs> Put them together. <laughs> That's me. I and love the sound effects. <laughs> you gotta have the sound effects. <laughs> um, I'm also really looking forward to Amanda Joy's um, second book. Um, the first one was A River of Royal Blood. And mm -hmm. the next one, um, I don't have the name of it in front of me, but it's coming out next Tuesday and I'm ready. Um, yeah, so there's that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just, I feel like I'm catching up on all of the books that I wish I had when I was younger. Like when I was a, a little kid, my family would go to the library every weekend, but we didn't, the, the librarians didn't really have young adult books with black characters. So I feel mm -hmm. like now that they're all coming out, I'm like, give me more, give me more, give me more. And I don't have deep enough pockets for that. So I rely heavily <laughs> on my library app. So. Yeah, shout out to public libraries. <laughs> um, Fred, oh, let's have Fred and then, yeah, we can come back to you, sure. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I just finished, uh, Concrete Rose. I'm sure that most people have heard of that little book, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> by Angie Thomas, um, Dear Justice, um, by the homie Nick Stone. Um, and, and I'm, I'm currently doing some research, um, for my upcoming books. So reading a lot of Baldwin, um, a lot of, uh, Zora, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to navigate those orders. So, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time, uh, if you're going to read anything, there's plenty of new authors, but, you know, give some love to the authors um, that we stand on the shoulders of giants, you know. Amen. Um, I'm going to add The Bluest Eye uh, by Toni Morrison, because when I read that book, that book sort of changed my whole perspective, you know. Um, so that is an amazing book. Everybody should read that book. I'm also going to add The Bells by Danielle Clay Clayton. Yes. That was the Dallas was the first time I ever saw a black girl on a cover. And I, yeah, that book was amazing. I'm also going to add uh, Dear Martin by Nick Stone. I love that book so much. It's sort of tattered. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, it's a good book when it's tattered. I love to see a book that's been, that's been loved. <laughs> um, I thank you for bringing um, Toni Morrison back into the conversation. Um, I want to end with her as we began. I'm going to, this is a very short quote and I want you to think about um, your answer to this question. So she, she did a lecture in 1992 in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, where I grew up. Uh, and it's, she says, what you, 
What you do imagine, sorry, I'm messing up her quote. Let me find my place. Mm. If you can't imagine it, you can't have it. If you can't imagine it, you can't have it. So I wanna close with us thinking about what do you imagine or what is your dream for black young adult literature? If you think about the next five years, what are you imagining and dreaming of? I am imagining um, a greater cohort of black women um, writing young adult literature. When I first started on this journey, um, it was about what, 2006, 2007. Um, and I kept trying to sort of burst through a wall that was not gonna ever open for me, you know? Um, but one of the greatest joys for me and one of the greatest comforts for me of this last year, this pandemic industrial complex has been the cohort of uh, black women writing young adult. It's been, you know, I spent my entire life sort of searching for my people. And I feel like this is the year where I truly found them um, because there's other women writing along with me. And I, I'd never experienced that before. And I hope that the cohort only uh, grows. So that's what I am imagining. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, you know, I, I think about something that was said earlier um, in terms of books selling that are kind of like the trauma books versus um, the books about just black black existence, right? And all other aspects of the black existence. And 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 that my hope is that everything gets seen, everything gets written, everything gets purchased and supported, right? Um, you know, when I when I think about my own experience. Uh, the Black friends sadly had to come out for me to get the opportunities to write the things that have nothing to do with it, you know, and I want those opportunities for us and for the next generation coming up uh, that we get to write about obscure things, we get to write about dynamic things, we get to write about beautiful things, painful things, beautiful things. Sorry, I almost knocked the computer over. <laughs> Go ahead, Roberts. Um... Uh... My hope for Black young adult literature is that, like you said, Fred, that we see everything. I hope that it isn't so easy for us to come up with books um, by Black authors or about Black characters, because there are so many to like sift through in our mental Rolodexes, you know? Like I want it to be overwhelmed. I want it to be very clear that this period, this moment that we're going through isn't just a flash in the pan and mm -hmm. isn't just a trend or something that publishers and agents are kind of um, looking for because it's hot right now. Like I want it to uh, be very apparent that this is here to stay, that we are just um, uh, getting more in inclusive and, and this uh, publishing world is is for everyone that's what i'm hoping mm. for that we see everything and everyone sees themselves or learns about someone else or that there's like it just feels like if you want to read something like you can find it somewhere and if you don't even know that you want it you discover it and there it is mm -hmm. for me i would say that i want you know black authors to be able to write the stories of our hearts or like namina says the story of our rage right mm -hmm. i love that one yes but um, but truly, so that it doesn't become like, this is the monolithic book about Haiti. This is the monolithic book about the Black experience in Miami or, you know, in United States, right? We want there to be just a wide range. And also I want there to be less of Black authors having to educate the people who interview us. Like if you come and you read one of the good ones like you were supposed to, me talking to you about intersectionality shouldn't be something what what is that you know like I want people to take the books that are being created now as an opportunity to do education on their own and to understand that it is constant work you have to keep at it and don't just buy the book read the book read it apply it and then go mm -hmm. forth but really I want more stories villains 
romance uh leads all of it everything in between so yes yes read it buy well buy it read it and go forth i love that that is that's our uh, call to action tonight thank you so much for being in conversation with me tonight. I am so happy your work is in the world. And I hope when we are able to be at festivals and conferences and signings that our paths cross in person. Thank you so much um, for being here tonight. And thank you everybody who's tuning in. Thank you, Renee, this was great. Thank you, bye everybody.